This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, no plans to stop prying into passengers' bags, but Labrador Marine says the searches will be more discreet. The fourth annual St. John's Short Play Festival kicks off tonight at LSPU Hall. I'm going to tell you all about that coming up. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. Last night here and now shows you a video which showed Labrador Marine staff searching a ferry passenger's bag. Now this happened in Nain a week ago and it was conducted by crew from the Homotic W and reaction to that video and the searches is significant, especially along Labrador's north coast. Our Jacob Barker is in Nain today and he has this report. Well, I think I can safely say that nobody I spoke with here in Nain today is in favor of how that search went down. Some are understanding that searches do have to happen in some cases, but don't think they should be happening like that. I spent the day getting some thoughts from residents and politicians about what they think, about what they saw in the video. They could have at least did this somewhere private, not right out in the open, right in public. Everything, all her belongings are exposed to everyone. There's no need of it. It's ridiculous. I don't like the idea of it all. Uh, they could go and do it in a more private manner mm -hmm. instead of out in the public and on the road. I think if they were going to do it, they should have let the public know first rather than just doing it right off the bat. It would be nice to see if there was a policy in place and um, maybe public consultations to see how members traveling on the boat feel about it? I don't think it's absolutely disgraceful to, to do it in public with people watching. If, if they're going to do searches, they should make the public aware first that searches are possible and let them know why they're being searched or why they're doing searches. But if they've got problems on the boat or someone is alcoholic and drunk on the boat, I think they should deal with it on the boat. They should have people, staff on board to make sure that it doesn't happen. Even though the uh company in their statement afterwards uh, while I was watching the news said, they said that they have the right to, to do that. Uh, where does it say that on the ship itself? I didn't see it because I traveled there this, uh, this summer and it was very, very disorganized aboard the boat. The, uh, there was people drinking on the boat, kids running around all over the place. It was dirty, it was noisy, you know, and there was no control at all of what was going on there. Simply because there wasn't enough crew. Mm -hmm. Last year, when the ranger was there, there was enough crew and things were under control. What's the difference this year? Well, those are some of the people that our Jacob Barker spoke to with earlier today in Nain. Now, for its part, Labrador Marine has no intention of stopping these searches. Late this afternoon, it released a statement which reads in part, we reserve the right to curb the use of alcohol, cannabis, or other illegal drugs on board our vessels by conducting searches of passenger luggage and carry-on if necessary. The statement goes on to say, we will designate an area on board the vessel to carry out those searches as they become necessary. And it's also worth noting that Labrador Marine did not elaborate on which passengers it chooses to search and why. A 68-year-old man from Gander is dead after a single vehicle crash on Route 331 near Rogers Cove. Twillinggate RCMP were called just before 8 o'clock Tuesday evening, and when they arrived on the scene, they discovered that the man had been ejected from the vehicle. Police say he was not wearing a seatbelt and died at the scene. The driver was the only person in that vehicle. The fisheries union says a lucrative crab fishing area should not be open to oil and gas exploration. Crab fishermen say nobody talked to them before a key fishing area was included as one area that oil and gas companies can bid on. The area they're concerned about is northeast of the existing oil developments and that's where they catch about half of their crab. And they're worried that if oil is found, they'll be pushed out. At no time were these harvesters consulted about how these further developments would impact their futures and their livelihoods and their individual fishing enterprises. So year after year, our industry is expected to adjust and adapt to the expansion of oil and gas development. Like we are not going to stand by and let someone take our livelihood. We've put too much into this. It's our life. It's our industry. And we're not going to stand by. And if we got to do it, we'll go out with our vessels and we'll just get in the way.
So are you guys ready to go back to school? Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah? Okay, but are you ready to start packing lunches again? Canada has a new food guide this year. We'll see how it's changed what parents are putting in the lunchbox. Time for our first look at the weather forecast and we're going to start with Hurricane Dorian, of course, right now thrashing the Carolinas right now. It's still a, a category two hurricane gusts up to 215 kilometers an hour. Just a monster that is going to be headed our way over the next few days tracking to the northeast going to be hitting the Maritimes on Saturday. The strongest effects will be there for sure and will hit uh, the island on uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning. That's when we'll start to see the effects. The remnants of Hurricane Dorian expected to be downgraded into a post tropical storm. So you can see gusts there up to 120 kilometers an hour. Lots of rain to come along with that. The, the west coast along the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador are going to be hit hardest by this. But there is a tropical cyclone statement in effect for the entire island and the south southeastern portion of Labrador. I'll get into some more details about amounts coming up a bit later. Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. The city of St. John certainly taking Carolyn's forecast uh, and notice of it and warning residents to take precautions this weekend as the remnants of Dorian do hit. And there are a number of things that you can actually do in preparation. First thing, stock up on batteries so that you can charge your electronics. Have 72 hours worth of food on hand just in case the power ends up staying out for longer than you think. And check to make sure that your flashlights are working and make sure to refill your first aid kit. Also, have lots of water on hand. Make sure to get all of your candles and matches ready in some convenient, easy to get to place just in case you do lose power. And of course, charge those cell phones. No power, no Twitter. The Western Brook Pond Trail, one year later. We'll find out what changes have been made to the controversial construction project coming up on Here and Now. More reaction about the latest government deal to produce and sell cannabis in this province. A third group has been given a tax break in return for a promise to bring money and jobs to Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, today the Conservatives have questions about who's been given this deal. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Yet another example of a uh, government subsidizing large corporations at the expense of the citizens of Newfoundland and Labrador. The NDP doesn't like the fact that Atlantic Cultivation has been given a break on its taxes like two other cannabis companies before it. Combined with the other two organized, uh, similar deals with Biome and with Canopy, you're looking at 120, 130 million taken out of the provincial economy that could be used for other services. The NDP also believes it's unfair to other local independent cannabis businesses in this province. They don't get these deals to kickstart their operations. As for the official opposition, it says the latest deal is an example of the Liberal government helping its supporters. It's quite apparent with the names on this list that uh, it's uh, friends that are being chosen. Is it at all uncomfortable for your leader because uh, one, of the, you know, one of the people is a, is a Crosby? Well, you know the old adage, right? You can't pick and choose your family. And obviously she's uh, married to the president of the Liberal Party. So, you know, we, we wish her luck as an individual, and, and but it has no bearing on our leader. The Liberal government disagrees with its critics. It says the cannabis deals are driven solely by the government's desire to bring jobs and money to this province. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. People put down some inspirational sayings and then they paint things to go with it. And it's really, it's really, it's really nice to go along and, and see one of these. How Western Bay is getting people to buy into their boardwalk. And look at that there. Here and now, managed to get our very own board. Stay tuned.
Eaton, of course, we were talking today about how we were going to uh, take a look at what's going on with short plays. Uh, Jeremy, how you doing? Uh, Anthony, we're doing great. Uh, we're actually standing on the stage. But as always, I don't know much about this, but uh, Patrick Foran <laughs> does. Patrick, thank you for joining us. My Appreciate pleasure. You. Patrick, what is this festival all about? The St. John's Short Play Festival is, well, is that. It's a festival of short plays here in St. John's, running September 5 through 22 here at the LSPU Hall. And there's 26 plays on this year. It's our biggest ever festival. It's our fourth year here. And um, I think uh, folks at home should make a point of coming down here and binging on some quality theater. So what is different about this festival than say other ones? Are there like first timers who get to come on stage? Like how does that aspect of it work? Certainly there are, well, I think what's different about this festival is that it's a real mixture. So we have some veterans of the theater community like Charlie Tomlinson and Alice Moorridge, Brian Marler, um, Courtney Brown, a, a bunch of people, names that people will recognize, and first timers, and often performing side by side. Because here at the Short Play Festival, there's up to six different plays on stage every night. So uh, when, when we say they're short, we're not kidding. There's a, a, the, the way it works is um, there's a seven o'clock show and a nine o'clock show every night. And there's three plays in each of those blocks. So you can come down here and see at seven o'clock, three uh, different pieces, and then uh, maybe pop down for a pint downstairs and then come right back up and th see three more. So the 26 will play over the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and do they play once, twice, three times? How does that work? So the way it works, it's, it's actually three weekly festivals kind of stitched together. So there's eight plays working in rep this week. So uh, the first six premiere tonight and then the next two tomorrow night and we, we just work in rotation. And then in week two, it's another eight plays. In week three, it's another eight plays. Uh, and I should point out in our third week, we have some theater for young audiences. That's the weekend of the 21st and 22nd. So uh, if, you, if the kids are driving you nuts and you're looking for something to do, come on down to the LSPU Hall that weekend for, uh, I think, Brass Button Man is a beautiful puppet show that's happening. And uh, the other one is called Tell. So those are some, there's, there's quite a, a variety of lot, stuff. A lot going on here. Patrick, appreciate your time. Now we're going to switch our attention from one Patrick to another. Patrick Dawson is a first-time director. Tell us a little bit about your show that's going to premiere tonight. Uh, my show is Harold Pinter's One for the Road. It is a play, short play done by the prolific uh, British play, pay, playwright Harold Pinter. And it follows the dramatic story of a family of three are being held by an insidious government official as political prisoners. Now you were telling me earlier that you studied at Memorial University and you attended this festival and that helped inspire you to be a director here tonight. Mm -hmm. And I gotta ask, the show's gonna go on in about 45 minutes. Are you nervous at all? Um, I'm most certainly nervous, but when it comes down to directing, it's mostly the work of the actors and the stage managers now. I'm just sitting in the audience. So some people find that more stressful, just sitting back and having no control over what happens from here on out. And some people find that a little bit more relieving. And I'm gonna try and stay on the side of relieving. <laughs> So really quickly now we're going to wrap up, but how thankful are you for this festival to allow you to get this opportunity, Patrick? I am deeply, deeply, deeply thankful as it is challenging, particularly in this economy right now in Newfoundland, to make your way as an artist, as an artist and breach into this community. And this is absolutely essential. Uh, festivals and different stuff like this, different short, fe short festivals are just so helpful at a low cost entry point into this kind of community and this kind of art. Well, we're going to get kicked off the stage because we've got to get ready for Patrick's play. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Patrick Foran, thank you. Fun fact, Patrick Foran and I shared this stage in the year 1998 for Bill Bad, Bill's Bad Dance, Little Shop of Horrors, and it was great, wasn't it? I had hair. <laughs> Lots of it. <laughs> anyway, so that's it for us. We're going to throw it back to uh, you guys in the studio. Well, this is new video showing the scene on Abaco Island on Sunday as Dorian came ashore in the Bahamas as a Category 5 hurricane. A storm, you can see that they're being blamed for more than 20 deaths, including a Canadian woman from La Salle, Ontario. She was living there and she'd been helping people with disabilities in the Bahamas. The number of those who were killed is expected to climb. More than 13,000 homes were destroyed, and that's estimated that's nearly half of the homes on Abaco and Grand Bahama. Hurricane Dorian, as I mentioned earlier, is now making its way towards the North and South Carolina coast, and it's packing a mean punch as it brings with it heavy rains and strong winds. 
So as I mentioned earlier, it will be uh, hitting the island uh, on the west coast mm -hmm. probably Saturday night into Sunday. Right. So yeah, right. something to keep an eye on for sure. Certainly will. But of course, there's uh, today and tomorrow. Yes, mm -hmm. today was a nice day. It was quite balmy in St. John's. Actually, we're going to start with a look at the highs today. 24 degrees in St. John's with the Humidex, though, is more like 30. Quite the contrast between St. John's and Labrador City, which was only eight degrees today. So a quick look at the headlines for the next couple of days. Lots of wind and rain in the forecast for northern Labrador tonight along the coast. Friday tomorrow looking like a very pleasant uh, day on the island. And then as I mentioned on uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning, that storm is going to hit. So we do have a wind warning in place for Nain down through McCovic for tonight. Gusts up to 100 kilometers an hour there and along with that lots of rain a rainfall warning for Nain and Hopedale 60 millimeters of rain expected by the time it's all said and done tomorrow should start to taper off uh, throughout the day tomorrow so for the island nice and clear for the west and central but some rain for the Avalon Peninsula tonight not a whole lot and you can see how that rain is going to be playing out in Labrador tonight also Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at some uh, showers overnight tonight so about five millimeters meters of rain for the Avalon Peninsula St. John's area tonight. Overnight lows of 9 degrees. Fairly breezy with a southwesterly gusting up to 50. For the west coast, gusts up to 60 there, but uh, some clear skies. As we move into Labrador, about 10 to 20 millimeters of rain expected for the Nain Makovic area. That's on top of what fell today and more to come tomorrow morning. Uh, the rain lessens, though, as you head into the southeastern portion. About 2 to 4 millimeters of rain expected for the Labrador City and Happy Valley Goose Bay area. So Friday uh, morning, uh, looking quite nice for the island. Those showers lingering along the coast there, but really barely a cloud in the sky on the island tomorrow. A little bit cooler than it was today. 18 degrees pretty much across the board in the east and for central. Lots of sunshine there. Cools down on the west coast, 16 degrees as the high with a westerly wind, 30 gusting to 50, so a little bit breezy there. As we get up to the straits, the winds strengthen slightly with gusts up to 60. Temperatures around 14 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. And then we're looking at those showers in the Kovic area. Going to see another 10 millimeters of rain in the morning, but that should start to clear as the day goes on and a chance of showers for Labrador City and Churchill Falls. So just to skip ahead a little bit, Saturday night, that's when this uh, tropical cyclone statement is in effect the entire island and the southeast co coast of Labrador. Once again, this is the track that Hurricane Dorian is going to be taking. Expected to uh, make landfall on the island as a post-tropical storm on uh, Saturday night into Sunday. And uh, you can see that the west coast and northern peninsula and uh, southeastern Labrador are going to be hit hardest with this, but pretty much everyone is going to feel some of it. I'll get into those details later. Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, for parents, one of the toughest parts of getting back to school is figuring out just what do you put inside your kid's lunchbox. Well, this year, Canada has a new food guide, and it's one that encourages us to think differently about how we balance all of our meals. But nutrition is just part of that balancing act. Here now is Zach Gowdy reports. Katie's turn. As summer winds down, the Ryan kids are cramming in as much fun as they can. But for Val Ryan, back to school means the return of some serious homework. I mean, one of the best parts of summer vacation is that you don't have to do it. I mean, that's what we, I look forward to not having to pack lunches every night. Food is only part of what goes into filling a lunch bag. There's the planning and meal prep, classroom allergies and picky eaters. Then there's all the expert advice and the impossibly high bar set by social media. We talk about it all the time. <laughs> I've had so many moms, like I've probably had the discussion three or four times this summer. What are you putting your kids' lunches? Um, the Facebook posts are going around. Everybody's asking, what am I going to put in my kids' lunch this year? Um, you see all the Pinterest pictures with the cute little lunches and the neat things. You know, um, People really do talk about it. This year, parents have even more to talk about. For the first time in more than a decade, Canada has updated its food guide. The new version shows us what to put on a plate, but does it make sense in a lunch bag? You know, there's so many lists of foods not to bring to school that sometimes it's nice to know what to bring to school. 
Eating healthy at school is such a challenge that some kids actually learn about it during summer vacation. Surprisingly enough, I had a fair number of parents contact me at the end of the school year this year um, and to meet with their children over the summer to work on their eating habits so that it actually made for an easier transition going back into the school year in September. Antle says parents can pack up the lessons of the new food guide by including more veggies and plant-based proteins while limiting packaged products, especially those that are high in sugar. Some of the big changes is that they're, they're going with more raw, natural foods. Um, you know, we've been advising people for years to, you know, break your half your plate as vegetables, a quarters of protein, quarters of starch, and that's basically what they've done. I think traditionally, if you saw a bento box kind of laid out, we'd put half of it as starch, and then we'd put a little bit of veggie and a little bit of protein. So it's just kind of rearranging the portions of where we'd intend to do it. But as every parent knows, there can be a big gap between what kids should eat and what they will eat. What's your favorite thing to open your lunchbox and find? A cookie. Is there things you don't like to find in there? Probably broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> what is it about broccoli? <laughs> and the asparagus. I don't oh, like yes, asparagus. Yes, the asparagus. No more asparagus. <laughs> no more asparagus. Then there are added challenges of making lunch for a modern classroom. We do try to have a little more plant-based, but that's really tricky in schools because you can't have nuts and you can't have peanut butter, right? So you've got to be aware of that as well. Even soy butter is not allowed in schools. The province's English school district is now updating its own school food guidelines. This year, 11 schools will pilot a new set of guidelines with a district-wide rollout planned for next fall. For parents, the seemingly simple task of making lunch is getting more complex and can be a source of serious anxiety. As a teacher as well as a mom, Val Ryan sees it from both sides. I know a lot of parents have come to me and said, uh, I feel so bad sending them with the jam sandwich. <laughs> it's like, you know, we understand like you have to have something that your children will eat and that's, that's what you've got to do. And um, maybe it's not the healthiest lunch at school and, you know, we try to give them something healthier at home when you can watch over. But at school, you've got to trust that they're going to eat what's in their lunch bag. And if a jam sandwich is all they want for now, try making changes slowly until their lunch looks more like the new food guide. There's always a story created around food, likes and dislikes, and if children are told that they're not going to like it, chances are they're not going to like it. So, um, you know, a lot of times it's trying one new thing and keeping everything else that you know that they like on their plate and just introducing one thing at a time. Remember, the school year is just getting started. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. The Western Brook Pond Trail, one year later, We'll find out what changes have been made to the controversial construction project coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, this week we've introduced you to new students, new principals, new teachers. Well, there's also a new education minister, Brian War, and here we are just outside the Confederation Building. Hello. Hi, Anthony. So uh, how are you feeling this, this first week of school? A new minister, what did you do to get ready for the job? Well, uh, actually, it's a, I've got to say it's a, it's a huge privilege uh, to be uh, uh, given the task of uh, being minister of education, early childhood, childhood development. And uh, I have to say that uh, it's been a it's been a busy uh, busy couple of months. Right. Did you manage uh, to get up to speed? I'm getting there. It's yeah. uh, you know it's a lot to learn. Uh, you know, um, coming from uh, coming from being a deputy speaker and uh, into the educational department, it's a huge learning curve. But I'm certainly uh, looking forward to, uh, to the challenges, and uh, you know I'll take them one at a time. Well, one challenge we reported on last night, uh, first week back to school, a school district says it's still looking for 89 teachers. Uh, apparently it's an unintended consequence of the new collective agreement. You surprised that the school district's looking for that many? Uh, I'm, uh, listen, uh, you know, I, I, I've got the news over the last couple of days. Our, you know, our, uh, our staff have been, uh, have reached out to the district and, uh, you know, we understand that uh, there were some uh, shortfalls and some challenges, uh, but we're working through that. Uh, we've been assured by the, uh, by the district that there's, uh, you know, there's teachers in classrooms and, uh, and certainly uh, we'll, we'll work with the association uh, to get through this and I understand at the end of it, I mean, uh, we'll get together and, and uh, rehash what is, uh, what's gone on and certainly, uh, you know, if there's changes that need to happen, uh, you know. One of the news stories that uh, sort of raised my eyebrows over the summer, your colleague in finance, Tom Osborne, pointed out that education is now the third item in spending, that actually we spend more now on interest payments and education. You know as well as I do, cabinet ministers fight around the table for resources. How do you make sure there's enough money for education going forward given our financial situation? You know, education certainly is very important uh, to the province and uh, you're right. I mean, uh, we're spending uh, probably 830, I think the budget was 830 million and a huge amount of money, uh, but certainly education is important and uh, you know, we, uh, we're implementing the education action plan and uh, it's a priority uh, certainly for me, a priority for our government and uh, and uh, priority for the Premier as well. And, uh, you know, we want to ensure that, uh, you know, um, we actually, uh, talking about the Education and Action Plan, uh, we, we put another $13 million in budget 2019 into the Action Plan. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we've got a commitment there um, to continue uh, with the plan. Uh, it's 60% six, of the, uh, of the plan is 60% uh, of the plan is complete to date and uh, continuing to work on, on the remainder. Right, so this is the plan, of course, called for hiring a uh, number of new hires as well. I, I wonder, as just sort of as we wind down the, this interview, obviously um, from the Premier's task force, there was an emphasis on uh, math and English. H how's that going? Because it was identified as a weakness. Yeah, uh, certainly we. Uh, We've uh, introduced uh, 24, 21 new reading specialists uh, this year, uh, which will increase to 104 over the next couple of years. Uh, again, in, in the math, uh, we've, uh, we've announced bursaries for math teachers and, uh, and you know, uh, through the uh, new stu student services model uh, with, uh, with phase one and phase two of the, uh, of the schools. Um, uh, we're getting positive feedback uh, just in Goose Bay uh, yesterday, spent the last two days in Goose Bay and had the opportunity to, uh, to sit with uh, um, um, teachers uh, in the classroom uh, and getting just a, a, a bunch of positive feedback on, on what, they're, what, they're what they're introducing. All right, well, certainly an interesting school year looking ahead. Last question for you. Sometimes there are political pressures for various reasons. We have lower enrollment. The government's always looking to save money. So I'll go back a little bit to the same question I asked you earlier. How do you, how do you safeguard the, the resources for education? Uh, with regards to safeguarding the resources, I, I think it's a commitment. Uh, it's a commitment, uh, you know, uh, from our government uh, to ensure that uh, you know education is so important uh, to the people of this province, and uh, you know we need to uh, to uh, take our part in, in ensuring that uh, you know our kids get the best possible education uh, as we can possibly offer. All right, Brian War, new education minister. Good luck. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Nalcor has finished raising the water levels at the Muskrat Falls Reservoir. The company says from now on, the water level there will be within the normal range of 38 and a half to 39 meters. Now, in the lead up to the reservoir filling, the Nunatsiavut government pleaded with the province to stop the flooding. There were concerns about potential methylmercury contamination of the ecosystem in Lake Melville, downriver from the dam. There are also concerns about the integrity of the North Spur. 
That's a piece of land jutting into the Churchill River where Nalcor built a concrete dam. Nalcor says it's monitoring the situation and that there are no safety concerns. A battle is brewing in Port Blanford over the use of a dirt road. Town Council says the provincial government is planning on making it a high traffic passage for industry and it warns the decision will create a dangerous intersection right on the Trans-Canada Highway. Here now is Garrett Barry got a look firsthand and has this report. You got a tractor trailer coming around here now <laughs> uh, across a, a narrow two lane bridge. And as you see, he's making a good run for this hill as we go along here now. And so if you're coming out across here and he's barreling up across there, it's definitely a dangerous situation. The town's case in a nutshell. This dirt road comes out right onto the Trans-Canada Highway and the visibility isn't great. So they say it's not safe for industry. So if they use five four trucks, um, it's about 440. So you're looking at this 440 times they got to come in, 440 times they got to go out. So it's nearly a thousand times. And then not, that's not including, like I said, the workers that got to come in here every day. Nalcor built this road specifically for the Labrador Island link. Now the provincial government wants to use it for another purpose. All those trucks will be heading to a wood harvesting site just next to Port Blanford. Holloway says if you take a drive yourself, you'll start to see his point of view. The people don't want the South River Valley harvested. The town don't want it harvested. And now the provincial government is creating an unsafe environment to basically get the, good, get the wood out. The mayor says it's not as simple as just building another resource road. He says if you move a little bit to my left, you're into private property. And a little bit to my right, you're into a salmon river. That leaves this one. That's fine with the minister. The roadway was used for heavy equipment and for large, uh, large transportation trucks and other, and other pieces of equipment. And that's what the road is being used for again today. He says there will only be about four trucks a day. And if that's unsafe, the town should bring forward some specifics. I, I work on evidence if there are specifics. I, I can't work on beliefs. I have to work on evidence. This is a regulatory process. The town is planning some action the mayor says they're going to try to contest a permit that they believe government needs to get. And if that won't work, they're threatening legal action over this road. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Port Blanford. So it's about uh, 24 minutes away from opening night here at the St. John's Short Play Festival. We're going to talk to the playwright, actor, and director of one of those plays coming up after the break.
Welcome back with six short plays. We'll soon take the stage at the LSPU Hall in downtown St. John's, all part of an annual short play festival. And one of them comes to life with a little help from a popular plastic toy. Now, earlier on here and now, you heard Jeremy Eaton bragging about his thespian skills. We'll head oh. back to Jeremy. Now. <laughs> Let's check in with our own Lawrence I Olivier. Think, oh, Jeremy. I, I think if you... I think if you saw 1998's Little Shop of Horrors, you'd know that I wasn't bragging about it because it wasn't an amazing show. Oh, okay. I just wanted to point out that <laughs> I was really good. I played Wino number one, or maybe it was Wino number two. Anyways, can't I can't remember. I wasn't bragging. <laughs> I can't remember. It was so long ago. Anyways, it's not about me. This is about Marie. Now, Marie. Thanks for joining us on Here and Now. Thanks for having me. So Marie, you wrote a play. Could you tell me about how that all came about? Yeah, so I started taking playwriting with Robert Chafe at Memorial University. And uh, that's the first time I ever tried my hand on it, fell in love. And uh, here I am today with one of my fellow classmates, Allison Woolridge, who is directing Garden by Mattel. So Garden by Mattel, Mattel sounds like a familiar name. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what the play is about? Yeah. So. Uh, uh, after an impromptu wedding ceremony, Barbie and uh, Ken come to life and explore existentialism. That 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 sounds pretty pretty deep for some plastic <laughs> characters. Uh, where did the idea come from to bring this to life? Yeah, so um, Robert gave us um, some prompts every week, and that week it was uh, a character that is trying to bury something in a garden, and another character who's trying to dig it up. So the it goes deep. It's deeply buried. There's a yeah, but it's funny. It's funny. Now I gotta ask. Uh, you said you took this playwright class with well-known playwright Robert Chape. Yeah. Uh, how many plays have you put on stage? Ah, this is the very first, and I'm also acting in it tonight, Jeremy. I heard a yeah. rumor. It's the first time you've ever acted. It is, frighteningly <laughs> enough. It is my first time. Um, but thank God I have Alison Woolridge directing me in this, uh, and she's been a saint. Now, Alison Woolridge, uh, you've been involved with Mamma Mia in Toronto. You've been involved with the Shaw Festival. You have a very impressive resume. So why would you want well, to come? Well, it's not Wino number two. No, <laughs> certainly not. That's the guy who goes, that's when you go down. Anyways, but why would you, uh, why would you want to come and be a part of this short, festival, short play festival here in St. John's? Really, it was because I wanted to support Marie. I had been her classmate, and I thought her writing was unusual, and I left a center and fresh and really original. And I thought I could bring it to life. Yeah. And we were originally going to, I was going to put something in with her, and then I thought, I don't want to do my piece, really, but I'd like to direct her, and if she'd be in it. And I love, I really enjoy directing first time actors or something. Um, they're not tainted, and if you can get your hands on them and they'll do what you ask, you can really bring something out of them that's quite lovely and actually really good, and it's happened with Marie. She's really good in it. Now, this festival, we were talking to Pat Foran earlier, and he said that this festival helps uh, newcomers like Marie get something on stage. Yeah. How important is an event, is a festival like this, to promoting uh, acting and writing in the city of St. John's and Newfoundland and Labrador as a whole? Well, it's incredibly important, Jeremy, because a lot of people don't get a shot. Like, if you haven't got a professional resume, really hard to get on stage. You have to audition. You have to know how to audition. You have to know people. It's difficult. This way, it's a lottery system, and people can actually just write something, ask whoever they want to act in it, and put it up on stage for people to see. And I think some pretty interesting discoveries have come out of it. It's given people the courage to continue to write. These are short pieces. They may go on to be full-length plays. They may go on to uh, another form, or maybe even a, a short film. So it's it's really important. Well, I know that you are, you know, fit, well, you, you're playing tonight, but it's 15 minutes until, I guess, the curtain comes up. So uh, thank you very much for your time, oh, Alison. Thank, thank you. you so much thank for joining you. us. Thank and I guess as they, as they say in the biz, break a leg. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Maybe. Anyways, <laughs> so that's enough from us here at the LSPU Hall. I'm going to let these ladies get ready for the show, and I'm going to throw it back to you in the studio. Anthony? All right, Jeremy. Thanks a million. Looks like they're having lots of fun at the LSPU Hall. I try my best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's uh, uh, Jeremy Eaton, also known as apparently as Wino Number Two, but he's Wino Number One in my mind.
Uh, to the West Coast now, a controversy in Grossmore National Park has been smoothed over, quite literally. Last year, the park came under fire for overhauling the iconic Western Brook Pond Trail. Well, now those upgrades are almost complete. Here now is Lindsay Bird checked out the final product. Tourists flock to Western Brook Pond Trail, even on the drizzliest of days, when there's no spectacular view to be seen. It's one of Gross Warren's top attractions, now entirely overhauled, after a two-year, $3 million renovation project. Controversy erupted when the half-finished trail made its debut last spring, with a rocky gravel surface much wider than the trail's former boardwalks and footpaths. Some people compared it to a road, but Parks Canada says the old trail was failing, inaccessible, and had to go. In 2019, the new trail now has a fine gravel surface, easier for wheelchairs, strollers and bicycles to use. The park has leveled out the steep sides of the trail, tried to blend it in with new trees and plants, and camouflaged culverts. I think last year, because we were mid-project and the trail was far from complete, people were not seeing it at its best. Uh, this year, because the trail surface is uh, more finished and we've been able to bring in the sides of the trail, do some revegetation, it's looking much more appealing and I think people are finding it a much more enjoyable experience. The park says this year there hasn't been any negative feedback. And while first-time hikers don't have anything to compare the new trail to, they also don't have any complaints. It's a little bit wide, but you don't have to worry about tripping over anything or uh, getting stuck on roots or mud, but it's pretty easy to walk through. Our hike was amazing. Would you hike in here again if there was a view? Yes, I would. I would uh, hike in this trail again. There are still a few benches and signs to be put in place along the trail to finish the project. And while Parks Canada has in the past floated the idea of an electric shuttle service on this trail to the boat tour, it says for now, nothing is in the works. Lindsay Bird, CBC News, Grossmore National Park. The people in a Conception Bay North community have found a creative way to beautify their town and attract visitors. The Western Bay Lighthouse Trails Committee is maintaining its local seaside boardwalk by inviting people to buy into their project one board at a time. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. The idea just took off. It is a beautiful spot, a boardwalk that stretches more than 500 metres to a lighthouse near the community of Western Bay. But the weather isn't always beautiful, like in 2010 when Hurricane Igor hit. Igor came along, picked up the boardwalk, turned it upside down and destroyed it. Money for repairs dried up, so people in the community took matters into their own hands. A few people started putting down boards whenever it needed it. Then we noticed that the boards were starting to rot and there was never any money to keep it up. But then Western Bay residents had an epiphany. Why don't we sell people boards and um, get them to do art on the board and we'll charge them for the boards and then we'll use the money to, to repair the boardwalk. And it has been working. At $15 each, more than 400 boards like these have been purchased. The artwork ranges from whimsical birds and fish to practical sales pitches. Tourists come and paint boards and people from away get people here to paint boards for them. So it's, it's just ended up being this amazing community project. It's turned a haunting shoreline into a busy local attraction that Cotter says is a treat even on gloomy days like this. Funny little picture a child has drawn or some beautiful picture of Cape Lynn that an artist has painted. And so to me, it's like I'm never alone. I'm walking with all these other people who've enjoyed the boardwalk. A little news coverage might help, but the need for upkeep is never ending. And Cotter says the project may have to attract some substantial funding to continue long term. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Western Bay.
Okay, so of course, Dorian, the main, mm. main news and weather story, and it'll yeah. hit us as well over the weekend. Yeah, the yeah. thing that everyone is watching right now. Uh, gonna start with a, another look at Dorian, actually. Satellite shot, this is where uh, Dorian is at the moment, over the Carolinas, thrashing about uh, gusts. 205 kilometers an hour right now, still at a category two hurricane. So that will be uh, coming our way by Saturday night into Sunday morning. But looking ahead to tomorrow, a very calm day actually. Uh, nice temperatures, 18 degrees for the east and for central. Lots of sunshine, fairly light winds, 16 degrees as the high for the west coast tomorrow in Labrador. Some uh, morning showers for Nain, and that should start to clear off throughout the day as well for the Cartwright area and uh, some showers for Lab City, 10 degrees as the high there. So Friday night, it stays pretty quiet still. Uh, lots of cloud cover there on the island as we move into Saturday morning. It's going to be a pretty quiet Saturday, the calm before the storm, you could say, because this is uh, Dorian making its way up uh, towards the Maritimes there Saturday evening. So we won't quite see that until later Saturday night. So Saturday looking like lots of cloud cover on the island, 14 degrees as the high in the St. John's area, 18 for Grand Falls, Windsor as well, Corner Brook and Portabasque. You can see those uh, late day showers starting as uh, the remnants of Dorian uh, start to hit that part of the island for Labrador on Saturday, looking like a pretty nice day, 18 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay with a mix of sun and clouds. So yes, once again, tropical cyclone statement in effect from Environment Canada warning us of what's to come Saturday night into Sunday. The entire island going to be affected by the remnants of Dorian as well as the southeast coast of Labrador up through Eagle River. And once again, this is the track that Dorian is going to be taking from the National Hurricane Center looking like Saturday night into Sunday, as I mentioned, going to be hitting us then. Winds gusting up to 120 kilometers an hour. Uh, this is how it's going to play out on the future tracker. You can see the rain, heavy rain starting a Sunday at midnight, Saturday night into Sunday midnight there. So it's going to be raining then and continuing on through the evening hours uh, into the morning and the heaviest rains along the west coast as well as in Labrador. So uh, the Canadian Hurricane Center saying that there could be as much as 75 millimeters of rain that could come along with this between 50 and 75 for the west coast and up through the northern peninsula up to about 25 for the east. Those numbers could change though as we go through the day tomorrow. Temperatures staying pretty warm uh, on Sunday 20 degrees in St. John's but cooler in Labrador. So looking ahead at the five day forecast things clear off nicely on Monday with a mix of sun and cloud and 16 degrees. Temperatures stay in uh, the mid teens as we begin the work week for central similar story there. A few showers moving in on Tuesday for the west coast a nice Monday coming there as well with some showers 13 degrees on Tuesday and for Labrador showers continuing through Monday and some cloud cover on Tuesday for Western Labrador those showers continue and into the single digits temperature wise so cooling down for Western Labrador and next week that's your forecast Anthony well, over the summer here and now has been making some roadside stops and so far chef Andy Bullman has tried cold plates in Upper Island Cove, tea buns in Small Point and her stop in South River. A bit different though, a little risque. We're at Marshall's Corner Stop and Fish Shop in South River. They sell everything you can think of, but I think we're in for a surprise. Okay. Ah! So tell me about your store. Uh, we're just a little one-stop shop. We've got a bit of grocery, some live lobster, a little takeout, um, a little bit of everything, some giftware. There's also something kind of weird here. Uh, we do our own little in-house boy and girl normal surprise bags that kind of evolved into an adult surprise bag. What made you think, oh, adults will buy this? Uh, well, we always had a little bit, like maybe a novel lift over, a little bit of this or that. So I said, well, let's try the adult ones. But the customers keep coming in and saying, are they really adult surprise bags? So I said, well, maybe I could try an adult surprise bag. 
So that brought us to the Triple X that Surprise Bay. the Triple X Surprise Bay. Are you surprised by the success? Uh, a little bit, yes. Ever had anyone buy one accidentally? No. Okay, I, no. <laughs> that's so the, lucky. The girls <laughs> try to tell people now yeah. this is a triple next bag just to make sure that we don't run into that issue. Yes. <laughs>I was thinking cosmos. <laughs> billions and billions of stars. We are merely a speck in this world and universe. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Good. Great shot. This was taken somewhere in the Burgio area. And a wildlife ecologist, uh, Isabel Schmelzer, I was sent told, this to us. I was told Burgio's having a great summer, not with the usual fog. Mm -hmm. I mean, look how clear that is for Burgio. What a spectacular Dang. shot. She Drops did. of Jupiter. <laughs> yes. No, she did mention in her note that that uh, light there is Jupiter reflecting off the water. I don't know, but I like it. I I'll, like the idea. I'll take Isabel's I'll word take for it. <laughs> All right. Beautiful way to end the show. Nice seeing you again, by you the way. You too. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Good night.